how slow the onset of progression of Parkinson's disease. Can we, can we actually do this? And I think the first thing to, to recognize is, what is Parkinson's? This is not a simple disorder. This is actually a very complex disorder. And the view about Parkinson's is, it's not just a movement disorder. It's not just something that's due to degeneration in one part of the brain. It's not just to do with dopamine. It, in fact, it may not even be a brain disorder. It might be something that sweeps in from the gut. It's not a static disorder, and it's actually, I don't think it's a single disease at all. I think it's an individual disease, and people need to be treated as individuals. And if you understand this, you get an idea of the magnitude of the problem we're facing in trying to do something about the disease process. Now, if you look at what we've done so far, is we've focused on this bit of the brain, and we've focused on the fact that we know that this chemical dopamine is missing from the brain, and if we put it back, then we can control movement. And we've been doing this for 60 years, and we'll either give you levodopa, cinnamet, matapar, we'll give you a dopamine agonist, rapinarol, pramipexol, reticotine, apomorphine, one of these drugs, and what we do is we give you these drugs, they put dopamine back into the brain one way or another, your movement comes back, but what we're not doing is we're not doing anything about the underlying disease process which inevitably, inevitably is going to progress. So what can we do in the future that's different? Well, we can do one of these three things. We can do some neuro-restoration, which means we restore or reverse the neuronal loss that's going on in the brain. We can do some disease modification, which in fact means we want to try and slow down the natural progression of the disease. Or we can go for the big one, which is neuroprotection. We want to stop the onset of the disease, or we want to arrest the progression of the disease. That, does that make sense? Doing it, doing it three different ways, OK? So if that's what we want, to, we want to do, how do we do it? Well, the first thing is that we've got lots of stuff going on. It's a really exciting time. There's numerous different approaches to trying to achieve the objective of altering the course of Parkinson's disease in train at the moment. You can transplant fetal human dopamine neurons back into the brain to put dopamine synthesis and dopamine production back. You can modify stem cells, very basic cells, to become dopamine neurons. Put those into brain to put dopamine production back. We can modify viruses so that they contain all the genes for producing dopamine, and we can put the virus in the brain and let it infect neurons and start to produce dopamine again. Or we can give you a, a growth factor, a trophic factor, that will stimulate remaining dopamine neurons to grow and to sprout and even to spread. And these are all very valuable of approaches. They're all one-off treatments. These are potential, in some respects, cures. And the important thing is there's ongoing clinical trials in every one of these areas. But these things are invasive. You need to have neurosurgery to have any of these because you need to inject them into the brain. You tend to put them into one brain area, and that's okay, but Parkinson's disease affects many different brain areas. They're irreversible. Once you've had them done, there's no going back. You, you can't take these things back out of the brain again, so you need to be very certain they're safe. And the other problem is you put them into a brain that has Parkinson's disease, and who knows what the Parkinsonian brain will do to newly implanted cells. It might well kill them off like the previous uh, host cells were killed off uh, in the first place. So what else can we do? Well, we can take another approach. We can design new drug molecules to attack the disease process. This would be what I would call classical drug discovery. We can take drugs from other therapeutic areas which we think might have a good effect in Parkinson's disease and reposition them into Parkinson's disease, and I'll tell you something about that a little later on. We can attack the final toxic step in nerve cell death. We can try to find the key to Parkinson's disease and stop that from happening. And all of these, again, very valuable. All are in ongoing clinical trials. Uh, these are easier to administer because they probably would come as tablets or injection. They have a widespread effect in the brain. They're reversible because you can stop treatment. They have a better effect because you might alter some of the motor and the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And what you're doing is attacking the disease process. And that's inevitably what we want to do in the long term, is get to the root of this disease. So if you're going to do that, you have to understand what causes Parkinson's disease. There are many different mechanisms that can probably lead to Parkinson's disease in terms of biochemical pathological change in the brain. 
Some of Parkinson's disease might be inherited. Some of the factors might be environmental, and there might be an interaction between genes and the environment. But the vast majority of Parkinson's disease, to be truthful, and I like to tell it as it is, remains unexplained. And that's one of the difficulties we have to overcome if we're going to do anything about this disease. And I want to emphasize something. I want to emphasize that people have Parkinson's disease for many different reasons. You might have a rare gene that leads directly to Parkinson's. You might have a gene that increases your risk of Parkinson's. You might have a gene that increases your susceptibility to something completely different that then gives you Parkinson's. Or you might just be aging. You might have risk factors, believe it or not, living in the country and drinking well water increases your risk of Parkinson's. It could be toxin exposure, pesticide exposure. It could be diet or even gut bacteria. The other thing is, it comes in many different forms. This is not a single illness with a single set of symptoms. People have in common the fact they can't move, but around that, there are different clinical presentations, different genetic backgrounds. Some people get it late, some get it early, some progress slowly, some progress rapidly, some have tremor, some don't, some people show different responses to drugs. Your other major problem, in addition to movement, might be you don't sleep well, you have pain, uh, your mind doesn't work as well, you might be tired. There are all these enormous presentations. And does this give you the idea it's not a single illness? It's something which is more complex, and the more complex it is, the more difficult it is to overcome the problem. So, how we've been going about this? People who leave their brains to research having post-mortem studies on brains from people who died with Parkinson's disease. And what we've done is we've gone into the brain, we've looked at the damaged areas, and we've looked at the processes which might be disrupted that lead to nerve cell death. And we found that in some people, there's too many free radicals. You have oxidative stress. In other people, the ability to produce energy in cells is impaired at the level of mitochondria. In other people, you have alterations in the handling of proteins which clog up the cell and cause it to die. But what I want to point out again is not all these changes occur in everybody with Parkinson's disease. Some people have perfectly normal levels, for example, of free radical formation. And I'm trying to emphasize this point again of this is not a single disease. This is complex, and it has to be looked upon on an individual basis. Now, what we've done with that information from the post-mortem studies is we've gone back to the laboratory. And what we've done is we've used toxins to mimic the effects that we've seen in post-mortem brain to check whether interrupting various processes, for example, at the level of energy production in the mitochondria, causes dopamine neurons to die in the brain. And then what we've done is when we've found that these processes are important, we've looked at drugs that block these individual biochemical changes. And what we've shown in the laboratory, at least, is that these things can stop dopamine cells from dying. So the next step is, logically, you take these things into clinical trial in patients with Parkinson's. And this is where, at the moment, we've come unstuck because when 38 clinical trials were reviewed a couple of years ago, what we found was nothing that had come out of the laboratory and taken into patients with Parkinson's disease had actually had a significant effect on the disease progression in these clinical studies. But you'll notice I say watch this space because this year you might hear something completely different. Now, this is very disappointing, but what we have to do is we'd have to try and understand why this situation has occurred. Now, it could be the experimental studies in the laboratory do not mimic Parkinson's. They do not give you a true picture of how nerve cells die in the brain in that disorder. That's perfectly feasible. It could be that when we've been around the cell, all we've done is shown that if you interrupt major processes in a cell, cells die. It's like saying, if I impair your liver, it's going to have an effect on your health. If I impair your heart, it's going to have an effect on your health. If I impair your lungs or your kidneys, it's going to have an effect on your health that may lead eventually to death. And really, all we've done in these studies is we've shown cells don't like their major organelles being disrupted. And so what we might have done is come away with the wrong picture about how Parkinson's disease occurs. But I don't think we 
can be completely wrong in the laboratory. I don't think we can, can be completely wrong in these post-mortem studies. I think there's one other factor that we really have to think about. And that other factor is how we've looked at these drugs in the clinic in people with Parkinson's. And what we tend to do is take a large group of people with relatively late stage Parkinson's disease, we give 200 of them a sugar tablet, we give 200 of them active drug that we're looking to see if it works, and then we go away and look at them 12 months later and we compare the effect of the placebo or the active drug on the progression of Parkinson's disease. And this is where so far we've found no statistical difference between these groups. But what if there's 10% of people in the active drug group who have Parkinson's for a specific reason, which is different to that from the other 190 people, what if those 10% of people were getting significantly better? In the way we do the clinical studies at the moment, we would not detect these people. We would not see an effect of an active drug. And my feeling is we may have gone wrong by grouping people together and saying you all have disease for the same reason and you're all going to be cured in the same way. So what should we do? The answer is we need to get you early, just as Alistair said. We need to get in there and have the greatest chance of affecting the disease. We need, to we need to take specific groups of people, for example, a small group of people with a specific gene mutation, divide them up, look at them for longer periods of time, and we may have a greater chance of success. We might be able to pull out patients with well-defined subtypes of symptoms, people with Parkinson's who've got constipation and don't have a good sense of smell, people with sleep problems, focus on discrete patient groups, and there we stand a much greater chance of having a success with one of the drugs that perhaps we've already tested. What else can we do? Well, first of all, we can shortcut the process. If you take a new drug from the laboratory and you turn it into a medicine, it's gonna take 15 years probably for that process to be complete. The risk of failure during that time is very high. The cost of those 15 years is enormous. And this means pharmaceutical companies are often unwilling to take the risk in going into such long-term, complex and expensive areas. But what if we do something I mentioned earlier? We take drugs which are already used in other indications and that may also be effective in Parkinson's. Shorter time, less risk, less cost, side effects known because they're already in man and we can rapidly explore hypotheses. And we're doing this. This is a list of drugs from other therapeutic areas that are currently in clinical trial for Parkinson's. We have taken anti-diabetics, cholesterol-lowering drugs, anti-hypertensive, anti-cancer drugs, anti-malarials, iron-collating drugs. They have been effective in experimental studies and we're now exploring very rapidly whether these drugs can also be effective in Parkinson's. And this will cut the process down from 15 years to something like three to five years. And here's an example, this was in the newspapers, nalotinib, a drug that's used in a form of leukemia. This drug has interesting biochemical effects and it's been moved from oncology to neurology and in neurology the very early preliminary open studies have shown some very significant effects on the symptoms of Parkinson's, something that we can now develop and do better and more intense clinical investigation. One other thing we can do, if we're not going to attack subgroups of patients with Parkinson's, what we can do is look for something that all Parkinson's patients have in common. And one thing that most people with Parkinson's have in common is that when you look in the cells that remain in the brain, you see these intracellular inclusions, which are known as Lewy bodies. And Lewy bodies are the pathological hallmark of the disease process in Parkinson's disease. Now, what we know about Lewy bodies is they are packed with this protein, alpha-synuclein, absolutely jammed, packed with it. And this protein seems to be something that sweeps through the brain as Parkinson's disease develops, and we've been very focused on why this protein is so prevalent and how it might be involved in toxicity to nerve cells. And what we've found is that this protein goes it's synthesized within cells, but as it is processed, it goes from being in very small clumps to forming in very large clumps 
that eventually form into Lewy bodies. But what we found is it's these little bits in the middle here which are much more toxic than the big bits of protein which eventually accumulate. And what these things, which are called oligomers or protofibrils, do is they interfere with the major processes that maintain nerve cells in a viable state. So this protein appears in various forms to be highly toxic, not only to dopamine cells, but to other nerve cells in the brain. And what we can now do, and this is ongoing because clinical trials have started, we can stop this protein aggregating. We can prevent the formation of aggregates. We can prevent the formation of the protein. We can prevent the toxicity of the small bits. And we really need to get to grips of how to tackle this protein. And what we need to do, again, is start early. It is too late when motor signs appear. You need to get in there and stop this protein sweeping through the brain in the first place. And here's just one example of how this is being done. This is a small drug which you can take by mouth, which gets into the brain and interferes with the ability of alpha-synuclein to become toxic. And this drug is in clinical trial, but with a drug company called UCB, and this will be something which may be very exciting in terms of eventually controlling Parkinsonian symptoms and looking at the spread of disease and progression of pathology. But this is my parting message. Don't expect a single treatment to work in everybody. This is a syndrome. This is not a single disease. You have different patterns of pathology and biochemistry going on the brain. You have different symptoms. There are different subtypes of PD. There is no single cause and no single pathogenic mechanism. And what we have to do is get over the fact that we do our clinical trials in one way. We are not going to find a drug which fits everybody. If I told you I was going to cure cancer, you would ask me what form of cancer I was going to cure and what subtype of cancer I was going to attempt to, to cure. And Parkinson's is going to turn out to be different and very individual to everybody who's afflicted by this illness. So the conclusion is there's fantastic amounts of work going on. Stem cell therapy, gene therapy, clinical trials ongoing. Stopping the disease in its tracks or stopping it starting in the first place is a much more difficult challenge. Modifying things like alpha-synuclein and its accumulation might be a significant way forward, but we must start all of this early. And what we must do is we must concentrate on the pathology that occurs in all parts of the brain, not just the dopamine bits. If we can cure that, that's fantastic, but we need to cure holistically the brain and rid people of this illness. Thank you very much indeed.